Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 181 of Dial the Gates, the Stargate Oral History Project. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for joining. Kate Hewlett is joining us for uh, this episode. She's going to be bringing us up to speed on her life, on uh, her film, The Swearing Jar, in which she wrote and adapted from her play. And uh, we're just going to chat with her about, you know, life and Stargate and, you know, some of her experiences becoming a mother. And that's all in this episode. Before we get into the thick of it, if you like Stargate, well, you wouldn't be here if you didn't. And you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you click that like button. It makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will continue to help the show grow. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops. And you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few weeks on the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. She is one of my favorite people, and I am delighted to have her back. Kate Hewlett, Jeannie Miller uh, from Stargate uh, Atlantis, and the writer of The Swearing Jar. Kate, so good to have you back. How are you? How's motherhood? How's life? I'm great. I always think you're going to say somebody else. She is one of my favorite people. She is one of my favorite people. Amanda Tapping is here. (laughs) Amanda has yet to do the show, and you're doing it. You've done it at least twice, so you know what? I I know. Um, yeah, motherhood is, is wonder, wonderful and, uh, crazy and, uh, I haven't slept in a while, but no, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It's like as life changing as everyone says. Absolutely. You know? So I was shocked to find out that you published the original play to this film in, uh, 2013. Is that right? That sounds about right. And long before motherhood, where you know it's yeah. it comes from. For everyone, we're gonna we're gonna. I highly recommend that you that you uh, watch this movie. We'll we'll be discussing some a couple of the major spoilers, but I will be like t- telling you where you can mute so you can skip that part and go and watch this because I don't want to ruin it for you. It but is was, a movie that is you really don't want to spoil this one, right? So we we think you should see it first. Absolutely, I and. I was, I I thought that it was made after you had uh, had your child because it's so in tune with that perspective, with the perspective of of uh, becoming a mother and bringing a new person into the world and the relationships that that um, that are uh, uh, central to those those experiences in life. Um, did you you know? How did you, how did you, how did you generate this without yet having that perspective? How were you so spot on? Oh gosh, I mean, this project has been ongoing. You know, I, I started writing the play in two thousand and three. Oh, okay. So, I started writing it when I was far too young to play the character, and I finished writing it when I was far too old to play the character, and. Uh, I guess there have been little things along the way where I look back at it and I think, oh, good, I got that right. You know, once having gone through something, I got to look back and go, did I do that justice? Yeah, I think it's okay. But um, motherhood being one of those things, I I, yeah. uh, I actually was supposed to be, I was supposed to play a small role in the movie and then I got pregnant and I couldn't play the part. I was like, I would have been nine months pregnant eight or nine months oh the irony i know (laughs) so then i couldn't play that part and then i was gonna do a little like hitchcock cameo (laughs) and then i went into labor i went into labor three weeks early and i missed the entire shoot um (laughs) and i'm actually glad because i i can be quite opinionated on set and i had been with the project for so long that I'm sure I would have had all kinds of input. And Lindsay, the director, Lindsay, Lindsay McKay did such a beautiful job. Um, and Jane Lohman did such a beautiful job. I love that Jane. Glad I wasn't there to mess it up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they nailed it. They nailed it. So I um, am going to be honest with you. Hmm. Uh, the, the, I thought that it was a rom com. Yeah, um, and I, when I have people on, 
for the show who have who have done a lot since Stargate. First and foremost, what I want to do when I bring them on is is showcase to fans uh, what they're currently up to and really focus on that. And sometimes the majority of the episode covers that. I wasn't really looking. I wasn't really other than the fact that if you didn't write it, I would probably not have watched this movie. It's yeah. just not in my wheelhouse. You know, some of yeah. them are. I love films like um, like uh, music and lyrics, you know, that has that this kind of an element to it. And this yeah. uh, has a very similar uh, musical feel to actually a film called Rudderless. I'm not sure if you've heard of yeah. this film. It's a good movie. Completely different thing. But the 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 uh, uh the 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 music element portion is very similar um and so i watched it this movie last night uh way last minute because i I was dragging my feet on it and i really am kicking myself that i took so long to see it because kate it it's so well written it's really good and okay. sometimes when I do these shows, I have to like inflate my excitement for a project because it may not be exactly <laughs> my thing. If you're if you're listening to my voice, see this movie. This is a good film, and I I am really really impressed. Like I was laughing the whole way through it. That there are some there are some lines that I'm going to be using personally. You know, she makes me want to <laughs> kill someone with my bare hands. You know, there there's some funny lines in this. <laughs> And it it plays with time. Um, I thought that I was watching it on my iPhone. I'm going to go back and watch it on my full screen now and see what I missed. But I thought I was like missing details. And I was like, hold on. Time is moving very interesting. Someone like my mother, my, no- my mother would not be able to keep up with this film. She, she, she wouldn't be able to detect the signposts that you've put in to follow the narrative and be surprised when things happen. Oh my gosh, maybe she's having an affair. Oh, wait a second. You know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I yeah. won't get into that. But mm-hmm. I was so, I was so surprised at how, at how wonderful it was, you know? And I, and then I was like, I shouldn't be surprised at that at all. This is Kate Hewlett we're talking about here. <laughs> what kind of reactions have you had to the movie? Now I'm going to stop blabbering and, and let you, let you talk a little bit about it. So, yeah, I mean, so the the Square and Jar uh, is the name of the movie. It's based on my play, um, which I started writing in two thousand and three. <laughs> got it got published in twenty thirteen, and then I continued rewriting. It got republished actually last year by Samuel French. Okay. Um, so that's nice because we have a new version of it. It's on Amazon. But, you can buy it. You can buy the play. Oh yeah. 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 I, if if it's so the Samuel French or Concord version is the new. Okay. It's it's rewritten. Um, not not majorly, but just things like in the play, there's like an answering machine <laughs> that plays in <laughs> anachronisms. <laughs> and yeah. there are a couple of things too that I didn't realize. Um, you know, I kick myself for not noticing, but there are certain things, even in we we really you wouldn't know from watching it, but we really wanted to have a very diverse cast for this film. That was always our vision for it, but it it didn't work out with scheduling and things like mm-hmm. that. And obviously, the cast is out of this world, extraordinary. Kathleen Turner steals the show. She steals the show, but I mean, like Adelaide Clemens is brilliant, and Patrick mm-hmm. J. Adams is brilliant, and D- Douglas Smith is brilliant, and mm-hmm. everyone. Everyone nails it. There's not a weak link in Mm-mm. the bunch. Um, so we're thrilled with how it turned out. I'm going to stop playing with my... <laughs> You're good. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's... Yeah, we're, we're... I'm just so thrilled with with how it turned out. But it was quite an um, quite a journey getting there. And one of the things I caught in the, in the play was like, you know, remarks... Um, in the audition, in the auditions, I got to watch a lot of people's auditions. Brilliant. What an experience to watch the talent that's mm-hmm. out there and the amount of time po- people put in to preparing for auditions. And oh my gosh, so many incredible actors. Um, mm-hmm. But there were a few, a few actors who uh, were not white. And there were certain lines in the script, like talking about, you know, rosy cheeks and uh, this kind of complexion. And they, they, certain people changed the lines for the audition. And I was like, yes, good on you. And also bad on me. Well, it would work for them, you know, So if in the event that you cast them, it's like they they found a way to make it work. What I I was saying, you know, I was accidentally saying this character's white and I, and he wasn't. 
I didn't, I just, I think I wrote it so much in my own voice that I didn't realize mm -hmm. and things like that I caught and I got to change um, for this version of the play. So I'm very I happy see. I got the opportunity to do that. And I'm not answering your question at all. The, res the How you have are. the reactions been? Yeah. Um, it's been one of the best experiences ever to be able to watch it in a movie theater with an audience. I've done that now four or five times at festivals, uh, including TIFF. And it was such an incredible experience to to get to hear people laughing. And then the silence when, you know, when things change and uh, it's, it's, um, I, I said at TIFF, it was almost like my wedding. I got to have a wedding. <laughs> That's what it felt like. Cause all the people I loved were in one place mm -hmm. watching this movie. And uh, it was just like a big love fest. And then also getting to, to watch strangers watch it and see how they respond and see people figure things out at different times. And that's all okay. You know, like some people get to the end of the movie and don't exactly know what happened and need to watch it again. And that's good too. Um, it's a very different film on second viewing. I think you'll find if you do, if you do watch it again, it's very different once you know, cause there are little, there are little things throughout. That, of course. Uh, yeah. On purpose, you know, that might seem like mistakes the first time or omissions or, odd choices and when you watch it a second time i think those things pay off so it, i was inspired right. by eternal sunshine of a spotless mind um yeah. every time i watch that movie i see something i didn't see before yeah every time. so i hope this one has just a little bit of that as well it's got a, a, a your your um i've mentioned it before your 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 play with time you know will we'll make it different from a viewing where you don't understand what's going on to the viewing after there's there's a character who sees another character and then the very next scene there's a cell phone call that's ignored and you think that you know one th that what that phone call is about but mm -hmm. then later on in the story it's like that wasn't what that was about at all because you're using time as a tool to just to tell the story it, in the in the play is it structured the same way it is yeah okay. yeah the structure's the same that was that was always something i wanted to do uh you know, maybe this is maybe we're getting into spoiler alerts here, but uh, not not quite. But uh, I, I guess it was always very important to me that the viewer or the audience member was going on the journey with the main character and seeing herself, uh, seeing her the way she's seeing herself mm -hmm. and seeing her actions the way that she is seeing her actions. Uh, and I think that the the nonlinear my dad mm -hmm. thinks that's a hilarious word, but the the nonlinear uh, way the story is told, I think, was the only way to achieve that. Interesting. So that was always there. That was always there. Yeah. What was the impetus for this idea? What was the original kernel that popped this story in your mind? I'm curious because there's a lot of elements yeah. at work here. You know, the yeah. swearing jar, the, the the object itself is kind of a through line, but it mm -hmm. wasn't as as big a chunk of the film as I thought it was. It's, it's kind of like an anchor for her, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of her relationship with her husband. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm curious to know what was the first image that kind of came in your mind? If you, if, you know, internal, eternal sunshine is a prime example of one of the things that triggered this story for you, where, where did it really come it from? Inspired. I think, I think eternal sunshine always inspired me because I, I loved watching a film and not quite knowing what was going on and and you know her, her hair is different color in each scene and you're sort of going what is what is happening right. here you're piecing it together as you watch it and i love that absolutely love that i also love the tone you know so much laughter in it and then mm -hmm. also just very poignant um well it's tragic so, tragic yeah yeah and i and i i think also there's there are many things that inspired me that i didn't realize until I went back and revisited them like weirdly I just watched Parenthood the movie Parenthood again <laughs> and I was like oh my god this is a, this has a, uh, affected my writing so yeah. much uh so yeah lots of different things there as, as stylistically I would say but as far as the kernel of the idea I I saw uh, there's a there's a Shakespeare quote quotation in the in the movie. Yes, uh, that's from Winter's Tale, and 
I saw a production of Winter's Tale with a friend of mine playing Paulina and she was just young. She was only, I think, in her early 20s playing the part and her partner had just, uh, uh, she had lost her partner. In real and, life? In real life. Okay. And she was saying, uh, she was saying these words, she was saying this, this, she was making this speech and I just, um, there was something just about that that was one of the first things that struck me. And that's why that, I know that's why that quotation has uh, played such a big role in the film. Um, and then another thing that, because originally when I started writing this, it was actually about a couple going through an infertility struggle. It started in a very different place and it started much more as a comedy. And I didn't have any, when I, when, when I was envisioning it, I didn't have music in it yet. And then I went to see another friend of mine who has the most incredible singing voice um, and is an actress, uh, an actor. And I went to see her do a concert and she was, she's very sort of uh, eccentric and uh, nervous and she was all over the place and she was tripping and she was, you know, you're watching this person, you're like, oh God, this concert's gonna be a real shit show. And uh, and then the moment she started singing, it was just Her confidence. Like, yeah, everything else went away. And yeah. there was something about that, that I was like, okay, that's definitely something I wanna capture as well. So it's sort of like these little feelings that I wanted to capture. And then it was through writing it that I found the story, which I would not recommend. <laughs> it takes 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> it takes 20 years. I didn't have an outline. I didn't have a, I didn't break the story. I found the story through writing, through writing and writing and writing and writing. I found the story. And uh, I worked at the, there's a theater here called the Tarragon. And I did the Tarragon Theater Playwrights Unit. And I think when I went into the unit, it was a very different play from what I came out with because this is a spoiler. This is I'm gonna I'm gonna do the first spoiler now. So stop listening if you yeah. haven't seen. Mute before. it if you want, and then we'll signal when you can unmute. Yeah, yeah. Because um, one of the actors came up to me who was playing Simon, and he came up to me afterwards and he was like, "Are you gonna kill him? You're gonna kill him, aren't you?" And I I I wasn't. I wasn't. And he said that and I was like, oh my God, oh my God. I know what I know what this is now. I know what I'm trying to, what story I'm trying to tell because I wanted to, I wanted to tell a story of moving on from the love of your right. life and it's possible to move on from the love of your life. And I, I'm watching the film and it, it happens like at the middle part of the film and I'm like, what story is there left? I was mm -hmm. I was really surprised at that. I was like, this is quick. I mean, we already had know from the mother talking that, you know, he he left he her husband died. So mm -hmm. I was that's already playing in the back of our minds. And, you know, then he just dies. And then mm -hmm. we get scenes later that inform that something's wrong. He's wearing glasses, mm -hmm. he's having headaches. So mm -hmm. then it backfills it in. But that was a great twist. He's like, mm -hmm. he just goes into the kitchen and then he never comes out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you, yeah. A, an actor helped you find that. An actor, because I had all these little comments about death and dying and I had mm -hmm. him having headaches and I had, it's like I knew, but I didn't know. Yeah. And it's sort of, the, again, the journey that she's on, right? So she's she's looking back at each of these memories and she's realizing that she knew. Yeah. She's realizing that he tried to tell her. She's realizing that she yeah. told him not to tell her. She's realizing all these things. And and as she's she's sort of piecing together the story for herself. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, but yeah, that comment was was the thing that made me go. That was oh solid. God. All right, everyone. You're good. You're good. I loved the <laughs> comeback. <laughs> I loved um the music. Thank you. And I got home and I I'm going to I'm going to lay one on you here Kate. I got home and I looked up the Swearing Jar soundtrack and there wasn't one. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm very upset because there are a couple of songs there that are my favorite songs, one that references May the 4th. Um, oh yeah. I I I want this music. Yeah. Can you, you send it to it. me? <laughs> you send it. There I is a soundtrack it. coming. Okay. Talk okay, to good. Jane. Talk to Jane. Jane. I haven't I talked to Jane in years. That sounds great. <laughs> 
phone her on her cell. I'll give you all the number. No, I'm just kidding. It, it's been a process. Everything's been hard to to get yeah. done. It's just it's very hard to make a movie, very hard to make a soundtrack. But everyone sees the movie and asks for the soundtrack. So it is coming. So we have good. We have someone on board who's who's getting it done. Um, a really incredible company, actually. We we're very lucky to get them. And uh, it is in the works. So it's coming. Okay, good. And then the, so I wrote the songs, um, but the score was written by Tim Williams, who you must know, right? I haven't know, come across him. Oh, the man's a genius. So yeah. he wrote all the, he wrote, I mean, he's, if you look him up, he's written massive, he that... does big, really big stuff. Uh, recently he did a movie called Pearl. He, he, okay. he, do I mean Pearl? Let's have a look at Did it. Did I just make that up? It's a horror movie that everyone's going nuts for. Just let me check if that's the right. Cocaine bear. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. Composer of Pearl. Pearl. You're right. Yeah, yeah Pearl. Um, but okay. also, oh, I just lost you. What did I do? There we go. I'm here. Um, he also wrote all the music for Dog's Breakfast. Okay. So you guys go way back. We go way back. Okay. Because he, um, his mother was best friends with my mother when they were younger. I see. And I remember I remember him. He's a, he's a piano genius. He wrote the, the musical Napoleon, which international success okay. uh he's yeah he's like um he's written for some pretty major films if, okay. if you look him up but um i remember sitting in his lap while he played the piano at my my mom and dad's house when i was a little kid and like i remember being like oh my god he's a genius and he is he's a genius <laughs> he can wow. write any kind of music uh, so he wrote the score for this and he was on he was on board from the very very beginning okay and then one of my um, oldest and dearest friends, uh, Chris Stanton, who played the role of Owen on stage, I think every time it was ever done, uh, he co-wrote a few of the songs with me as well. Okay. Um, I would go to him with the, like May the 4th is a good example. I went to him with the, the, the tune and the lyrics and he, filled it all out and figured out the guitar part and added harmonies and was like, what about if we had a bridge? And so there are a few songs in there where we, we worked on them together and that's one of them. Okay. Um, and, but yeah, I, I wrote, uh, I wrote the the majority of the songs and there will be a soundtrack in the next couple of months. I'm hoping. That's great. I, uh, I, I'm interested to know what um, performances surprised you. In the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the, in the finished product, um, with, like individual scenes that you go back and you go, either you know, I didn't interpret that look that way, mm -hmm. or they 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 ran that in a different direction, or you know this uh, this was they they pulled something out of this that that I didn't that I didn't see or took it further than I than I thought. If there's anything specific. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that with Adelaide, who played Carrie, uh -huh. and Patrick, who played Simon, yep. I feel like they got inside my head and they heard every word the way that it was like intended to be spoken. And it was a very crazy experience to hear it for the first time, watch it for the first time, having not been, been on set. Um. People oh, so you weren't on set through production? No, because of this, because of this dumb baby. The damn baby. Jeez. The damn baby was born literally three weeks early. <laughs> okay. Patrick's baby, Patrick's baby was born on the final day of shooting, and oh, he had wow. delivered it. He delivered it, yeah. Oh wow! So okay. it was a, it was just a big baby fest. But no, um, I, I think I visited set for a few hours one day after she was born but i was like <laughs> um so adelaide and patrick yeah they just sort of i don't even understand how they did that um patrick asked me a lot of questions had a lot of thoughts and uh incredibly smart theater questions mm -hmm. he he challenged me on things he wanted to answer it's a hard character to play because of everything he's going through internally and he ended up just just knocking it out of the park mm. and adelaide I, I, this is so funny because i don't obviously see myself very often but everyone who knows me said that it was like she was channeling me i think uh, that uh she looks a lot like you i, I think more creepy she her, 
her vocal cadence is very much yours. I thought that's, you were talking through this movie. It was very that's strange. What everyone says. That's what everyone says. And I, I can't see it. But apparently yeah. her singing also, all my friends were like, did they dub your voice? And I'm like, no, she's way better than I am. But, um, <laughs> but I, I mean, she's Australian. You know, she doesn't sound anything wow. like me. And we had never met um before she did the the part so it's kind of bizarre she's just a really good actress yeah. um douglas his performance surprised me in the most wonderful ways as owen because the guitar player I heard owen yeah so i heard owen in chris stanton's voice my friend my friend chris uh who who was a part of it for so many years i always heard it in his voice and I always heard it a certain way. And Douglas was very different, but I loved it. I, I wasn't, there wasn't a moment where I thought, I wish he was doing this a different way. It was just, he took, he took it, he ran with it. Tiny bit of improv, which I would have not been crazy about um, normally, but I loved what he did. Mm -hmm. um, there was a bit of improv with the little, with the little kid, which was necessary to make it feel real. So that was all really beautiful. And he just added little, I don't know, there's just little moments of him that I thought were were wonderful. The scene with um, him with the bunny ears, um, uh, it suggests that the, the movie leaves that the, the movie leaves a lot of this open at the end, but it suggests that, you know, that there is that there is a future with him and this family. You know, I, I took it that way. Um, maybe, yeah. maybe not. I'm I'm not I'm part of me wants to ask you what your intention is with 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 these, with with two certain characters moving forward at the end of the film, but the other part of me is to just like, your probably intent is to leave it open for everyone else, for everyone to interpret on their own. She's ready. Yeah. For whatever's next. Right. That's the th the the thing is the journey of positioning herself for for emotional. I don't want to spoil it. Damn it. For no, what's no. next, right? So she's ready for what's next. That's what it. That's what it's about for me. What, where, whatever you think that is, um, I think I have my own take on it. I do have my own take on it, but I don't think it's right or wrong. I, I, right. I just wanted that I wanted hope. I wanted yeah. a sense of hope. The director captured that perfectly. Yeah. Um, she did these these direct. The one thing that's not written into the screenplay is those direct address moments where the where the character looks right at the camera. I think there are three moments, and. I think those did a beautiful job of of telling the story in, in silence. Um, yeah, she brought a lot to the she brought a lot to this project, Lindsay, and she came on quite late. We had mm. three different direct, four different directors uh, in total, but three different directors uh, over a couple of years, and that was part of what was so difficult. You know, you get attached to each person and to their vision, and people put so much time into the project, and then scheduling or things go wrong or COVID or, uh, you know, conflicts or all life. kinds of things. life. Yeah. And so by the time we got to our fourth director, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anymore. And I, I, I love her. I love her. She, uh, she's so smart. She's, we, sh we share a brain. No, she's so smart. We share a brain. She's so smart. We share a brain on comedy. We really do finish each other's sentences when it comes to comedy but when it comes to filmmaking she she's much more she's much more about the silence she's much more visual than i am there are all kinds of things that we we differ on and i think it's a beautiful partnership because mm. we bring something to each other so i love what she did with it, it it's not it's very much her her um you can see her in this movie and i think it's it's mm. wonderful and That's... she pulled things out you know yeah. she pulled things out all those supporting characters <laughs> one of one of whom you may have recognized just a um, wee bit <laughs> <laughs> that was jane jane cast him <laughs> but nepotism uh, it was supposed to be a woman <laughs> he stole a part from a woman um, but uh but all those characters had more to do particularly um the character played by jade ma who, who's in the bookstore yes jess yes yeah, she had it. She has a much bigger part. She's comic relief, lots of talking in the play. In the no, she's not in the play. In the movie. Oh, she, oh in the movie. Okay. The movie. Yeah, all those characters I added for the for the I film. See. The play is just four people. 
I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm definitely I'm going out and buying a copy of it. So Good. I want to see the differences. I want to see like the evolution. So yeah, we'll buy both versions then. Absolutely. You know, okay. I don't even know if you can get the original one anymore, but okay. um, yeah, Simon, Carey, Owen, and Bev are the are the only four Got characters it. in both versions. And so I added Cyrus, who's the barista. I added Jess, who works at the bookstore. I added um, the daughter. I added anyone else did I? Oh, the doctor. And uh, yeah, like lots all these characters that were spoken about. Right, implied. But yeah. We didn't get to meet them. And so I got to fill that all out. And then funnily enough, they got pulled back again because the film is so much, uh, so it's told through Carrie's perspective. So it's almost like that dialogue is there, but it's under uh, score or it's right. under, or it's, you know, uh, you can't quite hear it because of stuff that's going on. It's just really interesting the way she did it. So well, everything's there were already in place, you know, and you want to make it more grand for, for a theatrical because it's all you know it's a theatrical presentation uh a movie presentation but at the same time i can see how those other elements were pulled back in because it's like yes. this is it's all here already you yeah. know um, yeah it, it was really it was really smart and really interesting to see it come come back to yeah a closer a cl it was closer to the play in the end yeah. so <laughs> isn't that interesting yeah did you yeah. ever have uh have you have you ever in your house had a swearing jar No, okay. I no, I didn't even. I I haven't ever considered giving up swearing. I don't think since I was a little. <laughs> when I was little, when I was little, I remember I I because we I've never sworn in front of well once I swore in front of my dad, but we we can't st we still can't swear in front of my dad. And when my partner swears in front of my dad, I'm like <laughs> still get so nervous. But not that he's like swearing up a storm, but you know it slips, it slips out sometimes. Um, but. No, I, I am a very big swearer and having, <laughs> having a child is the first time that it's crossed my mind yeah. because she's now just getting to the age where she's repeating everything. Right. Where so I've had a couple of things where she's like, shit. Um, yeah. So I have to start being careful. But it's a great framing device because it sets the expectations of, of standards for what the family wants to set, you know, moving forward for this little person in their world you know it's all it's a it's it, I, I thought it was a great framing device for the movie so thank you yeah. i can't remember how that came about i don't remember i think again i just wrote it into a scene mm -hmm. that it turned into it and the, the the play had a different title before and everything i mean it's it's funny how that that evolution has just been mm. epic well and i <laughs> I can't recommend this thing enough for folks. Um, you know, get your family together and and sit down and watch this thing. I um, I am sorry that I did not uh, report on it when um, you you were developing it or when it came out. It's my job to know these things, and I missed it. And I feel really bad about that because it's so good, Kate. And uh, and I want to get to some fan questions because they're probably going to ask the one that I want to ask next. Um, which is, uh, you know, when is your, wh what do you, what are you wanting to do next? You know, do you, do you have anything, you know, that you're going to want to to do to try and top that and maybe make it a little bit in, in less than two decades? I know, right? <laughs> um, I, so I work mostly in TV. I I'm work exclusively in TV. I would say this is my first feature and I, with TV, you have to write stuff so quickly. And so I've, I, you know, I have that skill now that I, I think I didn't have before. Um, but I would love to do a follow-up feature. And I do have a few ideas that are, okay. that I think would be good follow-ups. Um, but, but what I'm working on right now is TV and I'm, okay. I'm working on a project with my, one of my best friends, whose name is Andrew Musselman. We, uh, we've known each other since uh, grade nine. He was in grade nine. I was in grade 13. And, <laughs> Um, we are working on a, a project with AMC, AMC Studios mm. and um, and Shaftesbury. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of the time. I'm still not allowed. I, I think I was talking about this last time <laughs> we met. Uh, I'm still. They still haven't really announced it, but it's still on. It's still going on. It's like a while. The second episode now. Okay. We've um, we've moved up the food chain a bit <laughs> and. Uh, we're we're pretty excited about it. We have yeah, we have a Canadian producer now and um 
I think we're we're hoping for the best. It, really hoping for the best. It's a really really fun pilot. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna keep my ear to the ground. It well, it's it's a it's a comedy, uh, sort of Christopher Guest sort of style, and it's got tons of music. Um, and it's very silly. <laughs> All right. For the dogs breakfast fans, I think they'll they'll get a kick. Right out up of their show. alley. Oh man. <laughs> And yeah. still a great film. If, if you if you haven't seen The Dog's Breakfast, go and check it out. It is good. Mm -hmm. um, Lock Watcher wanted to know, you know, actors add so much of themselves to their characters. Rodney and David are clearly similar. What did you carry uh, from your life into Jeannie um, when when you were when you were brought on board for season three? Besides your irritation with your brother. <laughs> <laughs> I've I snatched the low hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I think that the sibling relationship actually was a big part of it. Um, having a brother who had accomplished so much in real life um, mm. and who was in his element and I was coming into that, you know, he, there was obviously a, that was being mirrored in real life because David was on the show. These, this was his world. I was coming into it. And obviously McKay and, and David, very different people, but um, you know, he, he welcomed me and made it a very easy experience mm -hmm. in real life. Um, and but I think that's still there. You know, you 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 look up to this person, and you want to do a good job, and mm. you want to impress them, and you maybe want to do like a better job. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I I think there was yeah, just that was that was all in there. Um, I think with the with the second episode, mm, the third episode, the that shrine, we did, the shrine, that was um that was there was something very emotional about that like acting those scenes with my brother where he was regressing and all of that Th that was you know that was a, a gift that was sort of handed to us by the writers um to get to it's a weird thing to act yeah. with your sibling and play siblings because it's so real like what you know the, the relationship's already there the way you are together is already there um you're not generating any of that and so then you're you're going through an experience together that's not real mm -hmm. but it feels real so I, I, there was something really cool about that um but i guess the other thing with genie would be i hadn't acted very much before i had done one show I had done a show called 11 Cameras and I had done the odd guest star, but I had never walked into something of this scale before. Mm -hmm. And it was life changing. And I think the story of that episode of her finding out that this about Atlantis and about that all this was happening and that this was her what her brother was doing and the, the magic of it all. Uh, you know, I've told this story before, but but seeing the little alien and being like, oh, you're really here. <laughs> you know, I, I can touch your little head. And um, like, it was, it was wild. It was wild. Stepping onto the set was wild. Doing walk and talks on that set. I, it, you, it felt real. And so I think a lot of the amazement uh, I felt as a, as an actor and in, in the character too. So. I drove a truck through the setup of, of, the the topic the last time I approached it when we were on uh, we, we were on <laughs> together but I want to I want to come at it from a different direction because it was such it, it's uh, it was such a, a beautiful episode the shrine mm. and it is a uh, it's a personal story for Brad I will not tell that story um, because he needs to come on and tell it mm. but when you got that script and when you were doing those scenes with your brother you're in another galaxy. Yes, mm -hmm. but you're dealing with something that could very be very real in happening. Tell us about navigating that story. David read it before I did. Um, he said, there's another one. You know, we've got another episode coming. And I knew that. And then David said, 
God, I can't get through this thing. He's like, I can't get through this thing without crying. So every time I read it, I'm crying. And I'm like, oh, David, emotional. And then I and then I read it and uh, had the same experience. And <laughs> I, I again, you know, I hadn't I hadn't been acting for that that long. And in rehearsal, you know, when you're doing the blocking and everything, you're supposed to just sort of mark it. You know, you don't like you like you're supposed to save your performance for when they're filming. <laughs> go figure uh but we oh god like the first time we we said those lines out loud together we were just we were mess and the cameras were off <laughs> and i think um yeah it was it was a really extraordinary experience it was really extraordinary um i don't know what else to say about it really i i I remember so clearly being in that room and, and um, see, and also David's, David's just so good, you know, like, so I felt like I was watching my brother deal with dementia. Like, that's what I felt like I was watching. And it was, it was very emotional. Um, and then I got to run out and leap into, into the Jason arms. Of Jason. arms. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, uh, can we take that again? I don't feel like I <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it was, uh, it was really, that episode was, was very special. I thought beautifully written. You, you know, you, uh, you take someone like Brad, um, and you, he's all, I've always considered him to be like a, a playwright, you know, his, his best scenes are, are two people, um, and just, just letting them, just winding them up and letting them go. Um, but uh, that's that's a really special episode, and and I think also it comes from the added benefit that this is your third outing into this it, in terms of a full episode. There have been there were cameos, uh, your third outing for the characters. So you know you had her established, and you didn't have to really deal with a lot of those kinds of things. This wasn't her first episode, you know. So you you even though you were still pretty pretty early on in your in your acting career, you could still say, okay, I I know who this is at this point. We're past that. What's mm -hmm. the meat of this story? Yeah, I was more comfortable. I knew who she was a bit more. I knew I knew who she would be in these situations. So, mm -hmm. and and the com and the character was more comfortable, right? right. The character had friends. The character knew the, the 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 relationships and the dynamics. And um, yeah, it was, okay, it's it well, it an incredible experience. Teresa MC, who do you admire in professional women? <laughs> Oh my God. In the world? Like in. Yeah, I, I suspect. Yeah, if, if, if there is like anyone um, who has really, you know, encouraged you to set, set certain tones in your life. The original director of Swearing Jar, the person who I pitched it with to Jane, uh, her name is Lara Atzopardi. Oh! Mario, Mario's. Asuka, she's Mario's daughter. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, I, need to like I know that name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she's Mario's daughter. She's she grew up on set. She's uh she's done everything you can possibly imagine. Every job in that business she's done. Um, and she's a she's a very accomplished showrunner, writer, director. Now, living in L.A. now. Uh, but she's someone who, even though she's younger than I am, because she's a jerk, uh, she's someone I look up to very much. She has three children. Oh, busy <laughs> um, life. Oh my gosh. She, when I, so she, she show ran a show called Backstage, which I'm very, very proud of. Uh, it was a, it was like a teen show, but it, it was very smart, beautiful music, beautiful dancing. Uh, it was a great show. And she show ran that. And that was my first co-executive producing job. And she, when we went into the writing room, her third baby was a week old. And she had a marker. And Laura had a marker in one hand and a sling with her baby in it. And she was breaking story. And she's writing. And oh, my God. Wow. Like, the auditions, if you listen to the back to the audition tapes, you can hear farts. <laughs> the baby was <laughs> in the auditions. These poor kids are trying to audition and you hear this. 
as the baby just like lets one rip but um she's she's a she's just an incredible very inspiring professional woman who's doing incredible things so wow, she that's... was supposed to helm the new Degrassi that was coming but I think it something something went wrong with the um network or something like that and they I don't think they're making it anymore but she was supposed to be doing that show and she's got like five shows on the go she's she's, she's going places oh she's going places yeah and we worked together on the LA complex as well on okay. Martin Garrett's show we worked together on that and um she's just someone I want to work with forever wow that's one person I mean there's so many that's so a great many. selection though that's really cool yeah I'm so proud of myself for having an accidental Stargate connection. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple. So, yeah. Uh, Tracy, um, would you ever consider doing voice work for audiobooks? I've done that. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. I've only done one. I've only done one. Um, it was so much work. <laughs> Which one? It's, what was the title? Time. It was called The Dow House. It's called the Dow House. I think I had to do 40 dialects and accents. Oh my gosh. And the whole thing is read in a British accent. The, the main narrator has a British accent. And then I had to do like every accent under the sun. And you, it's a lot of hours. I mean, a lot of hours. <laughs> um, so it was a really cool experience, but it, it's a time consuming. Yeah, it's a lot. You know, if I could get into that like audible world where there's like where it's lucrative i think i would do more of it because i really enjoyed it but it's it's quite it's just not very lucrative for the amount of time right it takes. no it's um, it's a lot of time consumption for only so yeah. much yeah but i i do a ton of voice work that's that's um that was my bread and butter until we got locked out of uh all union members have been locked out of um commercials now it's it's been a real uh it's really been a really bad 12 months wow um, we're not allowed to do any any work at all and i'm not sure how that's even allowed wow. but all my i had four campaigns they all got given away to non-union performers uh so we not only did we stop auditioning we lost all our work and so all the com most of the commercials now that you see on tv and that you hear are non-union um and it's just a yeah there's like it's been really really bad that sounds like so a cluster like yeah, I don't wow. even understand. Uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of people working to try and change it, but it sort of like makes you wonder about the union and how to how to make the union more effective. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know they're trying very hard. It's just the ad agencies. I don't know. I guess everyone wants to make a buck. So yeah, yeah. You think that there would be some middle ground somewhere in there? So. Yeah, I know people who are having to sell their houses, you know, people oh who are gosh. making a consistent living uh, yeah. doing this. And I I, I lost, I would say I lost 50% of my income last year um, and, and had a toddler. So that's, you know, challenging. But also there are people who this is their entire living. And lost and everything. Good living. And they worked their way up over many, many years and it disappeared overnight because... Uh, yeah, an agreement didn't get signed. So, wow, wow. Yeah, so I'm hoping it comes back. I have my little booth set up in the basement, gathering dust. Yeah, absolutely. You know, everyone after COVID, they moved. You know, a lot of them set up their own. A lot of people in, in closets. You know, because yes, the, 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 yeah. all the fabric. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to do under the. I used to get. I'd be like, uh, I have to do a voice audition. <laughs> Just get under my bed. <laughs> Absorb the sound. <laughs> but then, uh, but then I recently now I can't. Um, I can't read my phone. It, it's if it's too far away, it's too far away from the microphone. Right. <laughs> it's very sad. Is uh, Fli Flip and Burn asked an interesting question? If was there any tech, any technology that you saw uh, working in uh, that world, that fictional world, that you would like to see in real life, that you would like to see and use? I mean, the gate's pretty damn cool. Yeah. <laughs> Is that an obvious answer? <laughs> it's a good one. Amazing. That'd be handy. Absolutely. Um, yeah. what, else? what other technology? I mean, oh my gosh, I can't remember. You're seen coming aboard the ship and uh, with, with uh, David and, and Amanda uh, and ad adjusting to that world. Yeah. Uh, that was that was really great. That yeah. Was, that was really, it's like... 
how would I react in that situation? Probably very much like her. So this is yeah. a spaceship. <laughs> yeah. And again, it was all practical. It yeah. was all practical. So it was that. It was that feeling of, of oh, my God. I just watched... Um, I'm obsessed with The Last of Us, and I just yeah. watched a documentary on the making of The Last of Us. Yeah. I didn't know Bella Ramsey was British. Oh my God, why is she so good? She was in Game but, of Thrones. Uh, I know I didn't even, and she stole Game of Thrones, and I didn't she realize did. it was the same person. She's she's extraordinary. So yeah. is he. But uh, there's uh, there's a documentary on the making of it, and it's like all they like built towns. They built towns, and there's like a little bit of VFX here and there, and and but like. To, when you get to act in those situations it's kind of a once in a lifetime thing because you're really there you know you're not you're not doing green screen i, I hardly did any green screen work at all on, mm. on atlantis i think when, when i'm looking out the window that's the only thing that's I it, the starfield yeah otherwise yeah. you're just dropped into it and yeah. you just exude that performance yeah so. yeah and the walk and talk i particularly remember just because it was like you could walk and walk and walk and walk. I know it keeps going <laughs> the whole <going>. corridor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Raj wanted to know: uh, uh, Are are you still up to return uh, in a future Stargate series? There are there are rumors that that another one's coming down the the pike fairly I usually, soon here. I usually give a jokey answer to this, and I'm like, no way. And I'm, I'm like, right now? <laughs> are you kidding? I'm not even a joke. <laughs> I, I mean, in a heartbeat, I'd be there in a heartbeat. I I. I loved working on it. I, I, it, it's, it's so not my world, but I loved it. Mm. Um, and the writing was so good. And yeah, I, I don't think I fully understood how, how lucky I was. I mean, I knew I was lucky to be on the show, but I, I think you have those experiences mm. very rarely where the writing is that good and the actors are that good and everyone likes everyone. And working in BC was awesome. Mm -hmm. And, Working with David was awesome, and look, I'm not even making jokes. I've, the, my child stole my sense of humor. <laughs> Can't even be mean anymore. Oh, that's funny. Dressing. Uh, no, I would go back in a heartbeat. Uh, I think David and I would love to, love to do that again. How how much of a, you know what? Let me let me let me move on to the, the Teresa MC. I, as someone who doesn't have siblings, I'm I'm curious to to this answer. Uh, Teresa MC, um, does competition between Jeannie and Rodney make them smarter scientists and better people? And how uh, do your siblings and you push against each other to bring out the best in each other? Mm -hmm. Solid question. Uh, or do you tear each other to bits? <laughs> <laughs> we just tear each other down. Uh I think in the case of Jeannie and Rodney, for sure, the competition made them work harder, constantly trying to outdo each other. They both, I think, believe the other one's smarter, but they don't want to admit it. But that's the perfect, you know, a perfect way to be because you're constantly striving for more. Yeah. And you're also not, it keeps you humble. Maybe not right. Rodney. Keeps Jeannie humble. <laughs> well, everyone um, else. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel that there's ever been any competition between myself and my siblings. I think with David and I, you know, we're nine years apart. I like yeah. to remind him well, he's nine years older than me. Um, so that didn't really, you know, we don't generally go in for the same mom roles. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I think I would say with that, he, he, he carved a path and so I knew it was possible. I think that was a big deal. Um, he told me, I mean, he jokes about this, but it's true. He told me not to not to go into acting, not to go to acting school. Don't go to, like everything I did, he was like, don't do this. As genuine really advice. Hard. Genuine advice. It's really hard. Don't do this. Do If there's something else you can do, do it. Yeah. Um, and he laughs because it's like, Every time he gave me advice, I did the opposite, and then it was the right choice. So he sort of takes weird credit for that. <laughs> um, but I think he just didn't want my life to be hard, you know. And I think he saw how hard it was for women as well, and he saw the focus on appearance for women and uh, how, what it did to women, and you know all that stuff. I think he just didn't didn't want that for me. 
And he was right. And it made me, in many ways, he was right. And it made me think about it more. And it made me question how much I wanted it. Hmm. And I really wanted it. So, uh, but I, I, I think I wouldn't have done it if he hadn't done it first. There's no way. So he made me realize that it was possible to make a really good living doing what you love doing. And I, I think that's, that was massive. Yeah. Yeah. It's a risk, you know, but, uh, not nothing ventured, nothing gained. Right. Mm -hmm. So Kate, I've taken you over. I apologize. Um, this, <laughs> this has been, <laughs> this has been <laughs> right. This Let's is, keep going. <laughs> it's been wonderful to see you. Um, Me too. I can't recommend enough uh, this film, The Swearing Jar. Go online, type into Google where to watch in your area. You can get it in, in the U.S. You can get it on, on Amazon. It's uh, I, There's a couple of services that you can rent it or buy it. Um, it's also, uh, where, where did we just say that it was? Oh, Stars in the United States. Yeah. But yeah, so iTunes, Google Play, it's all there. Stars, it's, free. it's free on Stars. It, in, the, in Canada, it's on Crave. Crave. It's on airplanes all over the world. I don't know why, but everyone keeps sending me photos of, of it on the airplane and they think it's recommended or something on the airplane. Uh, um, yeah, it's a weird place to watch it, but go for it. Uh, yeah. I'm really I'm really tickled for you. And uh, please stay in touch and um, we're going we're gonna, to uh, wrap the show up. Okay, and so. I'll let you know when the soundtrack comes out. Please do. So. I, I was I was in pieces when I did. I'm so glad to hear that it's happening. So we have a a, a Canadian Screen Award nomination for um, best song, uh. but it's for the swearing song. <laughs> 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 I don't think we're gonna win. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. It reminds me yeah. of Martin Garrow with his film Young People Effing. Yes. So, oh man, yeah. another oh, another great film. All right, Kate. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up here. All the yeah. best to you. Thank you for everything. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Bye. Okay, talk to you soon. Kate Hewlett, everyone. Uh, Jeannie Miller in Stargate Atlantis and the writer of The Swearing Jar. I cannot recommend um, this film enough. Go and check it out. Uh, you will uh, You will have a good time. And it's got some, like, sci-fi elements to it, too, with the... In terms of like the movement of time, you know, it's it's that's it's not strictly a sci-fi element. It's, it's a it's a, a presentation choice, but uh, it works well. Next to my Naquita generator over here, we have a new set piece that I wanted to share with you. So my friend Guillaume Saint Pierre, otherwise known as Brazet, he is making these uh, Stargate Command flags. It's very sturdy, um, very, very well constructed. I love it. And as soon as I saw that he was producing them, I said, I want one for my show. So if you want um, one of these, you can go to sgc.goodies at gmail.com, send him a message, let him know, and uh, get yourself one because uh, I, uh, I absolutely love it. He's done, he's done a great job, and it's going to be a, a part of our set now, uh, uh, going forward so that information is available in the description below and also in the end credits as well and on top of that um, he's also produced a confidential document he's replicated these re replicated these from um, the show so this one uh, he's taken the uh, the folders that we released through PropWorks and has made them into uh individual pieces that you can that you can buy this includes the mission port re mission report that was created for politics for the uh the original abydos mission uh in children of the gods um and then you know as i've i've gone through and read these he's taken pretty much every document that i've been able to find um that was released through the show uh, in terms of uh, paper documents and put them in here. So all the way from the Abydos mission in Children of the Gods to, I, th I think, and there's, there's, there's cool color pages as well, to, um, I think there's a document for, yeah, General Hank Landry. So all the way up through at least season nine. There's, there's some cool things all the way through here. So the, um, the, the folder, the, the replica folder of... Uh, 
uh, confidential information and the flag are available through Brazet. All you have to do is email him at sgc.goodies at gmail.com. Uh, and again, that email is in the link below. Thanks so much to, to Kate uh, for joining us on this episode. And I really recommend um, the, the movie. Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. And if you want to support the show further, get yourself a t-shirt. We have tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies also available for all ages, as well as cups and other accessories in a variety of sizes and colors at dialthegate.com slash merch. And thank you so much for your support. We do have a couple of new items coming really soon here, but I'm just waiting uh, for more information on those. I think there were a couple of questions for me. Have you tried getting David and Kate Hewlett on for the same show? For this one, actually. And David said uh, we should just interview Kate. And then I watched the movie and I was like, well, obviously, that makes perfect sense. Uh, we did, uh, let me see here. Tracy, I would love to see David come in in a panel to discuss AI. Um, so we had, uh, Lawrence Maroney from Google last week, along with, uh, executive producer Robert C. Cooper, great, uh, 90 minute discussion on artificial intelligence. A little bit of Stargate was woven in there. Not as, not as much as I had intended. Um, but I was content to give Rob the floor on most of that one. And it was a fascinating discussion. Uh, so I really recommend you go and check it out. I would prefer to have, have David back for, um, a, uh, uh, a Stargate uh, AI that's uh, been modeled in the personality of Rodney McKay. <laughs> so, um, I th and I think that one exists. And if I'm not mistaken, I think David made one over at. Um, let's let's have a look here real quick, so you guys can go and uh, and check it. No, I don't. I don't have that link anymore. Um, I think it's is it character AI. Let me see. Yeah, character AI, and go and search, uh, uh, go to the website, beta.character.ai, and do a search for Rodney McKay. Um, let me do that real quick here, if I can pull this up. And yeah, so Dr. Rodney McKay, heroic, brilliant astrophysicist, genius leader, at D. Hewlett created this. So, did David Hewlett make you? Let's ask him. He's thinking, the heroic, humble, brilliant, genius scientist. I was written by brilliant writers just like myself and played by the highly talented David Hewlett. So, yes, I suppose he did bring my brilliant, humble, heroic self to life. <laughs> and he created an image. Wow. What is up with that? Okay. We need David Hewlett on to uh, to, to voice this character. So, David uh, please consider coming on in a month and a half or so when, when, when we're ready to do another one to, uh, to narrate <laughs> these, uh, cause that's, that's hilarious. We just did one with Jack O'Neill and it was a huge success. Everyone loved it. Um, I, th I think, uh, I think Rodney's would, would be brilliant if, if not more brilliant than, than Jack's. Uh, I appreciate everyone tuning in for this episode. Thanks again to, to, I almost said thanks again to Jeannie. Thanks again to Kate. Uh, my moderating staff, Summer, Tracy, Jeremy, Reese, Anthony, you guys are the best. Uh, big thanks to Frederick Marcou at Concepts Web uh, for keeping the site uh, up and running. Uh, my producer, Linda Gate Gabber Fury. Thank you, Linda, so much. Uh, I think that's, that's what we've got for you here. Robin Mosley is coming up in uh, 50 minutes. And uh, we'll be bringing him in to discuss uh, Dr. Reimer from Season 10 and Malachi from Window of Opportunity to uh, share some stories about um, uh, what is regularly rated as the number one episode of uh, Stargate SG-1. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. I appreciate your time, and we'll see you on the other side.